the supreme controller. And the supreme controller. Atra. 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 <coughs> no. No. <coughs> there is no. There is no. Varakshanam. Varakshanam. <coughs> Dissimilarity. Dissimilarity. Anu. Anu. Minute. Minute. Abhi. Abhi. Even. Even. Tat. Tat. Of them. Of them. Anya. Anya. Is being completely different. Is being completely different. Kalpanam. Kalpanam. Imagined idea. Imagined idea. Aparata. Aparata. Useless. Useless. Yanam. Yanam. Knowledge. Knowledge. Cha. Cha. And. And. Prakrite. Prakrite. Of material nature. Of material nature. Guna. Guna. Equality. Equality. <coughs> According to knowledge in the material mode of goodness, there is no qualitative difference between the living entity and the supreme controller. The imaginative, the imagination of qualitative difference between them is useless speculation. <coughs> According to certain philosophers, there are 25 elements, among which as a single category is stipulated for both the living entity, the individual living entity, and the supreme Lord. Such impersonal knowledge is declared by the Lord to be material. Jnanam chapra karatir una. Such knowledge can, however, be accepted to establish the qualitative identity of the Supreme Lord and the living entities who expand from Him. Materialistic persons sometimes believe that there is a Supreme Spirit in Heaven, but also think that human beings are identical with their material bodies and thus qualitatively and perpetually separated from the Supreme Lord. Knowledge of the Lord's qualitative oneness with the living entity, as described in this verse, refutes the materialistic concept of life and partially establishes the absolute truth. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu described the actual situation as a Chintya Veda Veda Tattva. The Supreme Controller and the Control Living Entities are simultaneously one and different. In the material mode of goodness, the oneness is perceived as one proceeds further to the stage of Vishuddha Sattva, or purified spiritual goodness. One finds spiritual variety within the qualitative oneness, completing one's knowledge of the absolute truth. The words navailakshyanam api anu api boldly affirm that the individual living entity is indisputably part and parcel of the Supreme Lord and qualitatively one with him. Any philosophical attempt to separate the living entity from the Supreme Lord and to deny his eternal servitude to the Lord is thus refuted. Speculation arriving at the conclusion that the living entity has independent existence separate from the Lord is described here as apartha, useless. Nevertheless, nevertheless the theory of 25 elements is acceptable to the Lord as a preliminary phase in the evolution of spiritual knowledge. Oh. According to knowledge in the material mode of goodness, 
There is no qualitative difference between the living entity and the supreme controller. The imagination of qualitative difference between them is useless speculation. We are reading today from Shimon Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 22, Elements of Material Creation. In this chapter, Krishna is telling <coughs> the world through his very dear friend and devoted Buddha. <coughs> scientific explanation of material nature from his perspective. Everyone within this material creation has a relative perception of reality. And in one sense, there is no two people that see anything exactly the same way. Because we are seeing through our conditioned, our uniquely conditioned senses, our uniquely conditioned mind, intelligence, and our very unique false egos. <clears throat> Somebody comes before the deity and they cry in ecstatic love. Other people come before the deity and they think, what are these people doing worshiping dolls? It's the same Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya was coming to Jagannath Puri and he saw Lord Jagannath. He saw Krishna in a three-form bending form, playing the flute and the moon of Sri Radha, he ran ecstatically <coughs> to embrace Krishna. As he was running across the Kirtan Hall, Jagan Mohan, every, it seemed like Krishna was millions of miles away. He was running and running, every step seemed like it was taking years. He was running faster and faster, and then when he finally came just before Jagannath, the ecstasy of being so close to the deity, he, he completely fell unconscious. Not just unconscious, he was in such an ecstasy of love of God. But there was no heartbeat, there was no breath, there was no pulse. He was totally internalized in the in the bhav. Mahabhav of love. That's what a moment's sight of the Lord Jagannath did to Lord Chaitanya. And we read some scholars during the British Empire, they went to Puri during Rati Yatra and they saw Jagannath. And it's absolutely blasphemous their description of what they wrote, what they received. They were describing Jagannath as some sort of monster. It was being worshipped by all these fanatical, crazy people. This gigantic chariot. And ourselves, we come before Lord Jagannath, who is in this temple today, depending on our mood, <laughs> let's just speak of who we are, depending on the particular mood of the day, we are seeing sometimes we're crying, <coughs> oh, the Lord is before me. Sometimes we're crying, thinking, I have to pay my bills and get to work. <laughs> 
And as you surrender unto me, I reveal myself to you. And the material energy is Krishna's nature. Krishna says this material energy consisting of the three modes of material nature is divine. Because it's emanating from me. In the tenth chapter of Gita, Aham Sarva Suprabhava Vata Sarvam Prabhava. Itimakva Bajante Ma Buddha Bhava Sama. I am the source of all material and spiritual things. Everything emanates from me. Om Purna Mata Purna Vita. The absolute truth is perfect and complete, and everything emanating from the absolute truth is perfect. Complete and generative Sangata, everything is emanating from Krishna. So, therefore, everything essentially is perfect and complete if we see it in relation to Krishna. Sri Prabhupada tells a story in his own life when he was younger, he was cooking puris for his deities. And then the Japanese, during World War II, began to bomb Calcutta. There were air raids going off. There was bombs exploding. <laughs> the people were screaming. The people were running to the air raid shelters underground. They said, goodbye, goodbye, come, come to the air raid. Prabhupada oh, said, that Krishna has come in the form of his bombs by being prepared to raise. <laughs> 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 saw Krishna in the bombs. Other people saw death in the bombs. Well, that explains how this relative consciousness affects all of us by the analogy of the kitten and the cat. A mother cat holds a little kitten in her mouth. And the kitten is feeling shelter, love, and complete satisfaction. Now when that same mother cat holds a rat in her mouth, same mouth, same teeth, same cat, but the rat is horrified. He sees death personified. It's just a matter of our perception. And our perception is very much according to our particular state of consciousness and our relationship. We're a non-devotee or a person who is on the bodily concept of life. Death is the most horrible thing. It's the end of everything. But for one who is connected to Krishna, death is a beautiful gateway to walk through it, to meet the Lord. We have seen devotees in this stage. A uh, simple little devotee spoke at Krishna. Um, He's just about 32 years old, and he got this cancer that kills you within a month when it's detected. He was just married a couple years before. His wife was pregnant with a baby. When I got the news, I was taking, I was 
at the bedside of his only this Bhakti Tirtas in Gita Nagari. When I came to Gita Nagari, Bhakti Tirtas said, he said, and everybody else was saying that he probably only had about two or three more days. And he said, please stay with him. So he stayed. Continued on for eight weeks. So while I was there, I got this call out of nowhere. Sarka Krishna, she was so healthy and calm and vibrant. Somehow or other, he lived. He only had a month, but he lived about six months. His wife gave birth to a child, a really beautiful little baby daughter. Express his gratitude to everyone and wanted everyone to just tell him about Krishna, the chant Hare Krishna. And he was just a second generation common devotee from the perspective of his own leader. Krishna's in material elements. Nobody sees the same thing in the same way. We all see according to our wish. You know, in San Diego, you have so many beautiful flowers. One person is looking at a flower, thinking, how oh, boring. Let me go to the drink some coffee and, and get on my computer. Mm -hmm. Let's go right by the flower. Mm -hmm. Take notice. Mm -hmm. Another person sees the flower and, then, and thinks, oh, this will look so nice in the hair of my wife. And another person 
person sees the flower and says, oh, this will look so nice in my hair, and if you want to see it. <laughs> and another person sees the same flower and thinks this is coming from this particular um, family of flowers, and this is coming here, and its, it's origin is somewhere in Peru. <laughs> and analyzes it according to its um, botanical origins. Another person sees the flowers, look at the fibers and the fragrance and the artist, let me, let me paint it. Another person sees the flower and thinks the beauty of Krishna from this seed. It's just a has no fragrance, has no color. <coughs> just a seed in the ground, mixed with some rainwater. And what it has become, what an incredible miracle. What a miracle. We should celebrate this miracle. It's by the grace of Krishna, by the offer of Krishna. Somebody else sees the flower and runs away because they have hay fever. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody sees the flower in the same way, but it's the same flower. To speak of how the flower sees you. <laughs> well, Krishna is here explaining how the elements of material creation, there are so many different things and so many different philosophies and so many different experiences within material nature. Because material nature is unlimited variegatedness. How it works, why it works. It's absolutely incredible. And to yoga means to see the unity. to see how our environment is God's environment. Just like Shiva Prabhupada gives the example, when we talk about nature, there's your nature, and my nature, and his nature, and hers nature. Material nature is God's nature. Maya Pyakshena Prakriti Sumite Sakshadakshana. Krishna tells all this material existence is emanating for me, and it's all working under my control. It's all mine. Sarva Loka Maheshwara is the proprietor of everything that he sees. <coughs> He's Sarveshwarishwara. He's the supreme controller of all controllers. Because everything is coming from him, everything is his. Bhaktivedanta Thakura, in this beautiful song. Manasa deho keho chokichu mo arpiyo tu apadu nanda kisho. He's giving his vision. He says, my body, my home, my family, my wealth, my intelligence, my skills, everything. It's all your property, my boy. It's all yours. I am yours. And therefore, whatever he's seeing, he's feeling ecstatic love for Krishna because he's seeing its connection to Krishna. When we're actually Krishna conscious and we see Krishna's participation in anything in this world, the laws of karma means it's not Krishna that's making this happen, it's me that's making it happen. But Krishna has set up the system it gives us the opportunity to make things happen. If I do some misdeed, we can't say, <coughs> that it's because of Krishna I'm suffering. Because of my misdeed, my wrong choice, that I'm suffering. But Krishna set up the system. <coughs> so therefore, in happiness, distress, and honor, and dishonor, and pleasure, and pain, he's always saying, Ultimately, that Krishna is connected, Krishna is the origin, Krishna is there. And in everything, we see its relation with Krishna. 
when we want to utilize that. That experience, that object, <coughs> is an offering of love to Krishna. That is Krishna consciousness. Krishna tells in Gita, for one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, for that person I've never lost, or have they ever lost to me. That doesn't mean everything is Krishna. But it means that everything is Krishna. Does that make sense? <laughs> Krishna tells in Gita, I am everything, but yet I'm separate. I'm the origin. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has explained it in such a precise, inclusive way. There are so many debates, there are so many conflicts based on very various philosophical principles of what is the world, what is God, who am I. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave such a comprehensive, precise, and inclusive understanding. Achyuta Veda Veda That the eternal soul is simultaneously one and different from the supreme soul of God. This eternal soul, the Atma within us, is eternally one and different from any other Atma. Material elements are simultaneously one and different from each other. I have a relationship with material existence that is simultaneously one and different. This Achyuta Veda Veda conception can be applied to every aspect of life. But it begins when we understand our the relationship of the eternal soul within this body and the supreme soul of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada gives an example of the sun and the sun ray. The sun ray is a Identical to the sun planet in quantity. There's absolutely no difference. They both give heat, they both give light, they both give warmth. But the sun ray is just a little part that's coming from the sun. The sun is the complete whole which includes all sun rays, and the sun planet does not come from the sun ray. So there's a difference. They are identical and they're different. Quantitatively, completely different. Qualitatively, <coughs> totally identical. Forever. That never changes. Jivera Swaru, Jivera, Jivera Swaru, Boy, Krishna, Ritas. Lord Chaitanya told Sanatana Goswami Ji. We are eternally the servants of Krishna. The Mai one saw Jiva, okay, Jiva Buddha Sanatana. We are eternally a little tiny part of Krishna. And because Krishna is, he has, he has total knowledge of everything and his complete independence, we have that little partial knowledge and partial independence. And when we forget our relationship with Krishna, and we forget the greatness of God, then a hunger, a false ego, covers us all. And we start thinking, I'm the controller, I'm the enjoyer, I'm the proprietor, I'm great. We are supremely great when we understand our connection to Krishna, because we're part of the ultimate great. That makes us really great. But when we forget our relationship with Krishna, then can we think ourselves great separate from Krishna? That's the source of so many, that's the source of so many frustrations. Because there's just so many things that are greater than us. Like time. <coughs> it makes you old. You lose your memory and you lose your strength and you lose your abilities and you lose 
your wealth and ultimately you lose your, who you think you are. There's nothing you can do. I can speak of volcanoes. I remember I was soul and God, love between Vaishnavas. These simple little things, if we're happy with that, whatever happens in the world will right? happen. If we don't find happiness in that, we can't be happy if everything's going our way. Because when things go our way, we're afraid of when it's not going to go our way. And that time will come. So how to see the world in a way that we're happy? This is a change of the way of Tattva. And for some philosophers, their idea of this concept of Ahundra Masmi is that I am God in all respects. Right now, I've just temporarily forgotten. I'm kind of dreaming. When I wake up, I realize I am the absolute truth. I am the supreme personality. I am the all pervading. Beyond personality. And that won't be that type of liberation <coughs> where we realize that we're not this material body, we're not this material mind, intelligence, or ahankar, ego. We are just the soul. We enter into that sunlight and we don't recognize our own individual identity. That is sometimes called mukti, or liberation from us. Realization of the oneness between the Atma and God. <clears throat> but in the spiritual world, it is the oneness and difference. It's the very agatedness of difference that brings about the highest realm of 
Ram, which is Leela, the pastimes of the Lord. Before we can enter into the Lord's loving pastimes, to experience God's infinite love upon us, and to express our infinite love toward God, and to see every living being as our eternal loving associates, express and feel the intimate love between ourselves and dance and sing forever with Krishna. That is the love. And for Vaishnavas who have experienced the sweetness of Leela, Prema, and Mukti's pretty boring, actually. <laughs> Boma Bhattacharya. He was one of the greatest impersonal philosophers of the world. And when he met Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya just took sannyas and was talking about how Lord Chaitanya fainted in front of Jagannath. The guards were ready to pick him up and throw him out of the temple. Who is this sentimental crazy person? <clears throat> Laying in our temple floor. So the Bhagavad Gita to try to happen to be there. And he said, no, no, no. He's definitely a saintly person. He's in some sort of ecstasy. I can tell by my spiritual <clears throat> analysis. Bring him to the house. And he tested Lord Chaitanya in so many ways. But there was no sign of life. And he took a very fine cotton piece and the finest, most subtle little threads of that cotton sweat. When he put it to Lord Chaitanya's nose, they slightly moved so he understood he's alive, he's in ecstasy. But how to get him out of ecstasy? So he started doing all these Vedic rituals to bring the person out of the samadhi, out of trance. Nothing worked. Soon after Lord Nityananda and the Kondadat and the Samadhi Bodhis came, Dhanadat and the Jagadana and the Vyasa started doing Kirtan on the Lord Shri. He came to external Kirtanas. Sarva Bhagavan Bhattacharya told him, that you should not go to the temple without me or my associates because I don't know what's going to happen before Jagannath on your own. And when you do go in, you should stand behind the Guru Dastamba. I'm not allowed in the temple, so I don't know exactly, but for those of you who have been in, I think the Guru Dastamba is some distance. Across the Jagan Mohan, the Kirtan Mohan, it's on the other side. And Lord Chaitanya honored that. Except on rare, rare occasions, he always stood behind the Guru Vistamba because Sarah Bhagavad Gita Shari told him to do that. And one day, Sarva Bhagavad Gita Shari was with Gopi Nathacharya, his brother in law. And he said, What sampradaya of sannyas did this young man? Chaitanya, take his vows. No justification of poverty. Sarva Bhagavan said, that is, a low, that is a lower status of sannyas. I will elevate him to Saraswati sannyas. Kupinathacharya said, he doesn't need you to elevate him. He's the Supreme Lord. <coughs> Sarva Bhagavan Bhattacharya said, Why do you expect me to accept him as the Supreme Lord? I'm a scholar of the Vedas. Where does it say in the Vedas that he's the Supreme Lord? In the Vedas, it explains that the Lord is Tree Yuga, which means he comes in three ages, not in Kali Yuga. In Bhattacharya and Mukunda, they began to present so many arguments from the scriptures how the Lord appears in a covered incarnation in the Kali very, very succinctly, authoritatively proven in the scriptures. And he comes, and he 
beautiful golden complexion in the age of calm to spread that kirtan of all the leaves. Krishna Lani Tasa Krishna Sarva Manusha Marshka Yagyai San Kirtana Kirtana Vijayanti Vishwara Sarva Bhama and his students, they were arguing and ultimately the argument Gopinath Acharya Frustrated with Sarvabhama Bhattacharya. He said, The Lord, the Supreme Lord, the object of everyone's ultimate devotion is standing right in front of you, and you cannot even recognize it because you have no love. You have not received even a drop of his mercy. You are like a dry, old, stale rice cake. <laughs> So we're just having a discussion. Don't get so angry. Looking at the child, went to Lord Chaitanya and said, This is what he's saying. And Lord Chaitanya said, he's, love, he's treating me like a father to a son. He's showing me affection. I receive that. I honor that. I love that. You shouldn't be harsh on him. I very much appreciate it. One day, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya says to Lord Chaitanya, you're only 24 years old, you're very beautiful, you've taken sannyas, you'll never survive unless I teach you Vedanta. <laughs> Somebody, an impersonal story, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, I will teach you Vedanta. What did Lord Chaitanya say? He bowed down to Sarvabhama Bhattacharya with folded hands and said, You are my guru and I am your disciple. Please protect me by teaching me Vedanta. There you go. So they sat and took an attempt for seven days. And every day, all day, from morning till night, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was explaining the Vedanta philosophy according to the monistic conception. And Lord Chaitanya, very politely, respectfully, every day he would come in, he would offer his pronouns, he would say, Lord, I can do please instruct me. Sarvabhama would instruct him, Lord Chaitanya would sit and listen. And after seven days, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya asked, You haven't asked any questions. I don't know if you understand it or not. Why are you so silent? I've been talking so much. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you understand this Vedanta? And I am very politely, very respectfully, very affectionately. I said, I understand Vedanta quite well. It's so easy to understand. It's like, it's like the noonday sun in a cloudless sky. But your interpretations are like a dark cloud that completely obscures the true meaning of Vedanta. And you see, because of the way Lord Chaitanya showed affection and respect, Sarvabhama, he already totally conquered his heart. If he said it any earlier than this point, Sarvabhama would have been offended. Sarvabhama, he wasn't offended because he, he loved Lord Chaitanya. He would do anything for him. And Lord Chaitanya, he, he felt so much respect and love coming from the Sanyasi. So, do you have a better idea? Lord Chaitanya said yes. And he explained. And Sarvabhama thought the Charya realized that it's a better idea. <laughs> and he became a great devotee. And he became such a great devotee. A famous verse by Lord Brahma Mukti Pade Sadeva. The day you come home, Susan, Shimano, Vrunjan, Eva. He very proudly one day he said to Lord Chaitanya, since I have tasted the sweetness of the Lila of the Lord, the Prema, I have understood this Achita Beta Beta Tattva that are simultaneously one and different from the Lord. The oneness and quality were such a demand the difference. The difference is only there to facilitate the ecstasy of loving relationships. This is the 
genius of Krishna's creation. The oneness between ourselves and God is to facilitate our eternal blissful condition. And the difference, why did God make us with the difference? So that there could be the deepest, unlimited, most profound loving affair between us and God, and us and each other. That's why the difference is there, simply to facilitate the highest ananda or ecstasies of the brain. So Sarvabhama so Bhattacharya said, since I have tasted the sweetness of bhakti, the word bhakti makes me disgusted. Or as we say here in America, turns me off. <laughs> so he said, I have, I have corrected the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he changed Mukti Pade Sadaya to Bhakti. He changed the word Mukti to Bhakti. Lord Chaitanya said, You're not allowed to change the Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> he said, No, I must change it. I can't tolerate this. And he said, this is the words of Brahma. In the, in the highest revelation of his ecstasies of love of God, he said this verse. Shukadeva Goswami repeated it. <clears throat> and then Marjan Kami said, no, you should understand that the Mukti, the supreme perfection or <clears throat> essence of Mukti, is Brahma. So therefore, Mukti is a good word. We just have to understand it from a proper perspective. Again, perspectives. One person sees, sees mukti as, um, I mean, I've heard so many things about mukti. I don't want to get into too many details in front of the deities, but I've heard somebody say, after they were constipated and they had emotion, they attained mukti. <laughs> Sleeping because it was very early, still dark. And he heard Sarvabhoma 
saying, Krishna, Krishna. Lord Chaitanya said, you just, he, as soon as he wakes up, he's crying out for Krishna. And when he came to step, Lord Chaitanya walked in and he gave him the prasad. And Samaboma immediately ate it. And he said, you are a very, very um, high born Brahmin. And Brahmins have their codes of lifestyle. According to the medical standard, you don't just eat something when you wake up. You have to wash your mouth, and you have to take your bath, and you have to do your puja before you eat anything. And you're just eating. <coughs> Why is this? And Sarvabhama Bhattacharya chanted a beautiful verse. It said, Mahaprasad is Krishna's mercy, and it's transcendental. And even if it comes from a distant place, even if it's a little stale, one should not hesitate from immediately honoring that person. He stopped doing that. He started going to the free booths where the homeless people would go. 
And after that, even that was too luxurious for him. In the middle of the night, he would go to one place outside the, one of the gates of Puri, Jagannath's temple. And what happened is the rice of Jagannath, after it would come out of the temple, the priests would give much of that rice to the shopkeepers. And the shopkeepers would sell the Mahaprasad. And that Mahaprasad didn't sell. It started getting decomposed and rotten. Then they would throw it into this big pile where cows would come and eat it. And some of the rice that was so rotten cows would chew it and spit it out. And that was what was left on that pile at night. Because all the rice, all the decomposed rice that was even the slightest bit palatable was eaten by the cows. And the cows all went to sleep. It was late at night. All that was left was the, cow, was the portions that were just unpalatable even for cows. Probably not collect that because he saw it was Jagannath's prasad. And he would wash it. And he would take that hard little inner part of it and, and eat that. And he lower. And that's all he ate. Nothing else. The Lord Chaitanya never heard about that. When he came to Raghunath's house, I heard you eating sumptuous prosapro. I want some. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <coughs> the Lord knows everything, and he knew exactly where that prosapro was. And he reached behind Raghunath, who was hiding it, and grabbed it. And then the Lord took a portion of it and ate it. And Raghunath said, no, no, don't eat this. Not fit for you. And even Swaro Damarar Goswami, the Lord's secretary, said, That's enough, that's enough. <laughs> and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in, in ecstasy of love, he said, I have tasted so many cakes and sweets and sujis and other prasad from Jagannath and from others, but I have never tasted anything so delicious <laughs> as what Raghunath does is eating every day. What was he saying? He wasn't saying from a sensual perspective. Well, he was, but not from a material sensual perspective. He was saying from a spiritually sensual perspective. He was seeing the love, he was seeing the grace, he was seeing God in that form. From his perspective. That's why we should be cultivated. To see every situation connected to Krishna and react, respond to every situation in a way that we show our love for Krishna. And bhakti, harmonizing everything, everywhere, everyone in the spirit of gratitude and love to Krishna. Even the most difficult times. We don't see we don't see goodness and evil, but we see the opportunity to be good and to love even in the face of evil. Because we see Krishna in every situation he's in waiting to receive. Something which you debate about. Unity and diversity. Simply as a facility that forever allows us to experience Krishna's life.
this. in such a way that it cause harm to others that we have to pay the consequence. <coughs> so we may have done that in the past, and now it's coming back to me. So we should understand it. It's because of me that it's happening. You can't blame God. If your father gives you a thousand dollars and you use it I know one person, his younger brother, father worked so hard his whole life. I grew up with these people. Father was the wealthiest person in our neighborhood. He really worked hard. And his, you know, part of working hard is you leave behind for your children, the estate. So he left a kind of large sum of money for his two sons. Once done, invested it in some land. They got cows and horses with that money. And got married and got children and were living in this nice land. And the other boy, he had the same exact amount of money, and he decided he got in some bad association and learned that he could quadruple the money in a matter of a day. He just invests it in one transaction of cocaine. So he did. And he got arrested. And that boy has been in prison now for 30 years. He got a 50 year sentence. Still in person happened 30 years ago. So one, one brother is in a beautiful ranch with horses and cows. He's got his own airplane, he's got his cars, he's doing all that. The other boy's in a little cell. It's the same exact money from the same father. It's just a matter of choice. Yes? So Krishna gives us everything, he gives us free will. And if we use it in such a way that we're going to have to get you know, karmic reactions in a negative way, we don't like Krishna. Yada, 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 masya, dvamir, bhavati, bharata, yada. Krishna comes again. <clears throat> and again, and again, to teach us what is dharma. Given the Bible, he's given the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Torah, he's given the Book of Mormon, he's given the, um, the Buddhist sutras, he's given the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Vedas, the Upanishads, he's given us the Indian, Native American Indian codes of conduct, he's given us basically maybe different degrees of elevated conception and understanding and realization, but there's common moral, ethical principles. Yes? The person that they commanded the cow, why did they think that was the best? Why didn't Lord Chaitanya think that was the best? <laughs> the cow of Prasad? Yes, but it is. It is. I mean, he had all the ingredients on the cow, and that's why. Because Lord Chaitanya is Pavagrahi. You see, when he was eating when you eat something, when you see something, when you touch something, everything is relative to our, our, our consciousness. 
In order to shape time, you also just tasting the, the grain, the fermented, the decomposed fermentation that may have been covering the grain, and the saliva of a cow. He wasn't tasting that. He was tasting the love and the spirit of devotion of Ramanath Das Yes. Just by if you love somebody and you have a photograph of that person somewhere in your house, or in your car, or in your wallet, or wherever you want it. When you look at that photo, do you just see um, you know, a piece of you know kind of plasticky paper with photogenic colors in it. Because that's actually all it is, right? It's just a piece of paper with different types of paints on it and colors. Yes. What do you see? Your heart. We, we, we see a photo in the bubble pot. In one sense, the photo is just a piece of paper with the different varieties of you know, colors in it. <coughs> And we see it, and our hearts melt in ecstasy. We are so alive. We feel all the mercy. We remember Prabhupada's instructions when we see the picture. <coughs> you go to a funeral, and you see a photograph of one's departed mother. People look at that photograph, and they cry. And really, what's the photograph? Because they're remembering the mother. To remember all the love she gave, all the things she did, all the words she spoke. Yes? So it's the consciousness that gives us an experience. You know, if somebody's mother passed away 50 years ago, <clears throat> and she used to make banana cake for you, could you imagine if she came back? 50 years of made a banana cake for you. What would it taste like? Wouldn't it just taste like banana cake? <laughs> you would taste your mother's love in it. I'm using very crazy creative analogies, I'm sorry. But the principle is this. And when Lord Chaitanya was eating that rice, he wasn't just eating rice. He was tasting the love, the devotion, the renunciation of love and devotion of Raghunathas was And he's, he's nothing more sweet than that. Krishna accepts our love. Shabari was taking fruits out of her mouth and giving it to Ram. He tasted nectar because she did it with such simple love. Krishna just ate a banana at Vidura's house. And he was in ecstasy. Duryodhana cooked a massive feast of hundreds of preparations by the best cooks in the whole kingdom. And Krishna would even look at it. Especially when he said, Wow.
comes behind human happiness. His he just his smile lit up the entire room. His eyes were glistening in ecstasy. He started crying in joy. What a smile. Spontaneous. And he looked at me and took my hand and said, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> He was still trembling. The fact that he was going to die was the same. So, and he, said, he, doesn't get any like this. he said, I would not tr change my position for anyone else in the entire world right now. Because <coughs> I'm tasting the sweetness of God's name like I've never done before. So dear Vaishnavas, we have prepared a nice breakfast for you and will be served out on the patio. I think someone's just pulling out some extra chairs for all of you to sit on. Hopefully we will have enough tables. That you have to use your laps. And then when you're done, if you could, uh, we'll be giving you all metal plates. If you could wash your plates afterwards. Uh, yeah, very fresh to you too. Your seats out there in the sun. Thank you. I brought this for you today. Oh, you did? We're going on the altar tomorrow morning. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.